Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so, so much for joining us today. My name is Helena Bennett. I'm going to moderate this panel today. Um, I'm a climate and human rights activist based in London in the UK. And today we're going to be having a conversation about one of the most important but also challenging activities um, of our time at the moment. And that is on being an activist, activist well-being um, and burnout as well. So 2019 was a really big year in terms of climate activism. We saw the largest climate demonstrations in history with over 7.5 million people on the streets, mostly led by youth. Um, but as I'm sure you're all acutely aware, the landscape has been completely different this year. COVID-19 has forced us all to stay at home, to protect ourselves, our families and friends, um, and everybody who is at most at risk uh, from COVID-19. Um, the challenge of how to be an activist without the power of public demonstration and being able to be on the streets has been really significant in terms of what we've been able to do. Um, but it hasn't stopped messages being spread to governments and leaders all around the world that we need really urgent and ambitious climate policy and action. Um, and all of this has been done remotely, digitally, virtually uh, through the power of technology and uh, community action. So on the panel today, we've got a really amazing group of people who are going to chat a bit more about the different challenges of being an activist and burnout and eco-anxiety. Um, so we have uh, Lynn, who is the founder of uh, Climate Strike Thailand. And Lynn, just a shout out to you because it's, I think, 1am where you are. So thanks so much for being here. Uh, we have Days, uh, who is a UK-based climate justice activist. We have Paul, who's a social justice activist, author, editor, and the founder of the Equity Literary Institute and Ed Change. And we also have Bonnie Wright, who's an actor, director, and environmentalist. So thank you all so, so much for being here. Um, and I'm just gonna start with a first icebreaker question. If you could describe being an activist in 2020 in one word, what would that word be? Um, Lynn, let's start with you. Hi. <laughs> Hectic, I guess. <laughs> oh, a lot of words for being... I don't know. I guess I've just never been an activist in any other era, so I, I don't really have anything to compare it against. But um, to compare it against other aspects of life, it's definitely very stressful. <laughs> yeah, stressful is a good one, yeah. Uh, Days, how about you? I would probably go for like the word malleability because at this moment we've really had to change the way that we do things especially with you know my activism which is mostly using my body and then realizing that can't be done now so it had to be really malleable and finding different ways to you know challenge power yeah I love that Bonnie uh, yeah, ooh, I would say this year has been a lot of patience, I think, with all parts of life. Uh, I think, yeah, that I just have to keep checking in with knowing that this is like a long journey and being patient with it, I would say. Yeah, I really like that. And Paul? Uh, I feel like it's a little crowded. Uh, I feel like everyone at home on social media especially in the US with this stuff going on here around police violence and racism are imagining themselves suddenly as activists. Uh, so it's feeling a bit crowded. Yeah, I re that's a really interesting one. Um, I think that for me anyway, the more I've learned about things like the climate crisis, the more I've realized there are so many other different issues that we need to start thinking about and how they all intersect. And yeah, I, I really, really like that word. Um, so I was involved with XR um, a couple of years ago, almost since it started. Um, and my experience of that was um, there, there wasn't really much discussion around eco-anxiety and burnout and um, activist well-being right at the start. So I'm really interested to hear from you guys about what you think um, around is there enough dialogue um, on issues of mental health and burnout within the climate activism movement at the moment? Paul, do you have any thoughts on this? I think there's a growing amount of dialogue about it. Um, I, I think mental health challenges in particular need to be named a little, a little bit more explicitly. I think there's a lot of dialogue about it and people writing blogs and that sort of thing. I, I think the problem is most of that dialogue is happening outside of movements and outside of movement organizations. So it's not seen as part of activism, but it's seen as something people have to 
remove themselves from activism to, to talk about and attend to. So a lot of dialogue, but not enough action uh, within movements. Yeah. And Dave, I know you've been involved in Extinction Rebellion in the UK. Have you found that that's kind of changed, that that dialogue about well-being and, and mental health? Yeah, I, I slightly disagree with you because one fourth of XR is regenerative cultures, which is well-being, which is saying how can we learn how to build behaviours to take care of ourselves, take care of the people around us and take care of our planet. So regenerative cultures and well-being is a really, really core part of what we do whether that's action well-being which is a thing that I feel like most people will be more accustomed to like um you know if you're super glued onto a road there is someone who's there with a spoon feeding you suits and reading you books for hours um or more to the actually having listening circles to really discuss about grief and a lot of the work that I did in Extinction Rebellion Youth was around that having that conversation and talking and creating community and I think that's a really large part but I think what we need to do is start bringing this more outwards so it's not just us in our activist communities talking about well-being or how we can create community but realizing that we're all in this together and that we need to start reaching out to other communities who aren't engaged in activism and making sure that well-being is at the core of that yeah i love that um lynn do you have any thoughts on this about perhaps how maybe it's a little bit different in thailand than in the uk it's very different here. Um, actually, just just as you know, my my individual like the the movement here is not as big, and also with with Climate Strike Thailand that I do, it's it comes off. Um, we do occasional strikes, so it's not like I, I gather with a group of people and all. And um, when I do talk about the environment, it's, it's mainly with you know people, other people who live sustainably and. Oh, and when we do discuss um, things about climate anxiety, it's a bit sad because the more we discuss it, the more we get anxious over it because we're like, oh no, you feel the same way about the world coming to an end. I do too. Oh no, um, is the world really going to come to an end? So sometimes I'd rather just not talk about it because it gets too stressful. Um, but yeah, very different over here. Um, less people in the community so less discussion yeah and bonnie do you have much experience of kind of activist burnout and if so how do you handle it and deal with it and recover yeah i think it's important to first mention that i feel it's always to be hyper aware of being in a position of privilege to have maybe tools and resources around mental health whether that's someone to talk to whether that's friends that I don't feel stigmatized by bringing up these kind of subjects with um, I think it's important to first mention that, that I do respect my resources that I have how I can manage my time as well if I'm if I if I need to pull back and I'm feeling burnt out and how I can maybe refocus and work on other things I'm doing so I think I'm always very aware of that and and how do we change that? How do we how do we change that uh, really skewed and unfair access to resources and tools so that people can have someone or somewhere to go to to talk to people when they are anxious and overwhelmed by this subject? Yeah, I really like that idea. Yeah, um, I'm interested to know if any of you have ever had to take a break from um, activism or the work you're doing, or or been close to kind of breakdown. I guess um, just because of how intense everything is. Have any of you experienced that before? Yeah, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, definitely. It's like you you're constantly thinking about crisis and extinction. It's, it's quite big <laughs> for anyone. Um, so yeah, I've had moments, but I think especially like with the way that regenerative cultures work, it's being mindful about yourself and your own capacity as a person. And, you know, I take regen breaks all the time and it's kind of weird as well, because I work outside of activist circles. And when you go, okay guys, um, I'm feeling really burnt out now, so I'm gonna take two weeks off for regen. People are like, what, excuse me, you've got emails to answer. So I think it is that kind of needing to push for society to really understand. And I think COVID was a really, really big push for that. Because I, I feel like people, especially at the beginning they realized how tired they really were from the life mm -hmm. that they've been doing and they found more of a relaxation of finding time to spend with your family with your friends whether that's over zoom or in person or you know going out into nature way more and that could be something that we can really take on post this post-covid time yeah yeah i love that um 
Paul, based on your research, do you have any kind of um, ideas about what the lead causes of burnout is in for activists? Yeah, well, uh, I did um, this research over a few years and my uh, friends and I who are doing this with me, we interviewed about 100 activists. This is, this is all in the US, but 100 activists who had experienced burnout. And I think the lead cause is one is just the amount of pressure activists were putting on themselves. Uh, people who are activists tend to have a big scope understanding of the suffering that's happening and the damage that's being done uh, in ways that most people don't understand or don't even want to understand and sort of the pressure of that and feeling like if I take five minutes of a break, then I'm going to, then I'm kind of selling out uh, when actually the truth is if I don't take five minutes of a break, I'm not in the long run going to be able to sustain my activism. So that, that is a big thing that came out. Uh, another uh, big thing is how people are treated by individuals and organizations that aren't happy with the activism that they're doing. So threat of police intervention, surveillance, and that sort of thing. Probably the um, most troubling thing that we found is that most of the activists identified their biggest source of burnout uh, as how they're treated by other activists. Uh, and the two big things, again, this is this is in U.S. organizations and movements. Uh, we probably interviewed about 60 women, and I would say two-thirds of those women had experienced sexual harassment, something between sexual harassment and sexual assault from other activists. Uh, we interviewed probably about 30 activists of color. Every single one of them had experienced racism within the context of their movement. So those are things, you know, and that gets to that kind of intersectional stuff you were mentioning earlier. Th those uh, seem to be the biggest causes that, that we've been able to identify. Yeah, I'm interested to hear if any of you have any ideas about how that kind of culture can be overcome. Um, I'm aware we've got three other female panelists on here, so I don't know if any of you have any kind of um, experience or advice about how to overcome perhaps issues like that that might arise in activist circles. I think it's 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 flagging it up. You know, I feel like, especially within activism, I don't know how much I can swear, but we don't take shit, <laughs> you know? And it's like, this is the whole point of it. So we shouldn't accept that in our movement and addressing things with kindness and empathy and just going, hi, you know, Sam, I didn't like what you did today. This is, you know, a microaggression and this is how it made me feel. And being open to have that dialogue within spaces because when we start to respect each other's boundaries is when we can actually start to understand how to respect the Earth's boundaries as well. And it's all interconnected. And especially, um, I think for me at least personally, I think it's 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 not the act of like the the like you know anxiety within my movement around you know well-being, but it's actually externally like I have a lot of social media hate that happens a lot of the time. A majority of the time it's not even about the climate. Um, it's mostly about my age or my race or um, my gender and having to figure out how to you know source through that and how to process those feelings that do come up when I feel attacked or I feel insecure. That's something that um, I think all of us need to learn how to do for now. And then we need to ask better from people around us in our society. Yes, yeah, it's a great answer. Um, so Lynn, I'm really interested to know what you think the key challenges are that you faced in terms of mobilizing people in Thailand and Southeast Asia. It's um, a big lack of education, a, lot, a big lack of awareness. So, you know, you, you don't fight for a, a cause if, if you don't know what you're fighting for. And because of that, I, I think a lot of movements in Thailand or in Southeast Asia are, are still lacking in number. Um, yeah, because we have very little environmental education here. It's just poor environmental education for example, here we're still struggling with plastic. Um, but what, what really gets Thai people is, um, or at least right now, is just the more human emotional stuff. Um, right now we're having these democratic protests going on very currently. Um, what I'm trying to do with 
people I work with right now is, is how to tie that, you know, that democratic um, movement and with the environmental movements. And there's, there's still that big gap, you know, of understanding of, of how environmental issues and social issues are, are interconnected. Um, so we're really trying to, to put that kind of human face on there. Um, and hopefully that gets more people to join in, you know, to really demand um, the right to clean air, to clean water, um, knowing that these are as much social issues as they are environmental yeah, and it, it feels like for, for someone like you that's kind of leading this um, this movement in Thailand and in Southeast Asia, that's just a lot of pressure for for a young person. <laughs> um, so, I mean, do we feel like there's you know too much being asked or demanded of this kind of young generation at the moment of, of climate activists in terms of trying to lead the charge? You know, you think of of other young um, activists around the world who have taken the, to the global stage recently and people you know their household names um bonnie what do you think do you think there's kind of too much being demanded this younger generation uh I, it's this hard i think it's really interesting and exciting that the youth are able to redefine their identity i think for so long we we're told that you know young people didn't care and they weren't politically engaged and 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 they were kind of lazy and I think that is so untrue and I'm excited that that narrative is being rewritten because I think it shows that there's just so much power in the youth and I think I think using social media to such high advantage and for really calling people out and for exposing and being a kind of generation of people that just really seek transparency and I think often honestly when I feel low and burnt out about situations I just usually kind of connect or speak to you know younger activists that I have the honor to to know and they really just give me so much hope in 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 amongst you know this conversation that's constantly about the end of something so I'm always so amazed but I do yes think that there's a huge huge pressure um to be always on I think that's the thing I think just being engaged on our phones and being having to always form opinions, I think is quite a difficult thing to ask of people to sort of always decide where we're standing um, or how we think about someone's tweet or someone's post. I think um, I do, I am concerned that that kind of puts you in your nervous system at quite like a high sort of like fight or flight mode. Mm. Um, so I don't know, I'm, I'm always torn. I'm like so pumped and hopeful. And then I'm also sometimes like silently worried, but I think that stems through all generations. Um, so yeah, I think to answer the question, yeah, I think at times it can be a lot, but it's kind of what else? I don't really, I mean, if this is your future, what else do you do, but fight for it? I think there's definitely that clash, you know, with, with young people just, um, observing what's happening in Thailand right now and and just you know from myself it's like I guess young people have this this kind of fire and passion of like yeah we we want to see a beautiful world um and then we're going to create that world um but then we've got this you know this huge fire that burns out so quickly and then it falls back into this vicious cycle of like yes I'm gonna save the planet and then you start saving the planet and then you realize like, oh, whoa, well, it wasn't that easy. <laughs> and then you get, or you, you break down and then you're about to give up and then you're like, oh wait, um, I can't just sit still. I have to save the planet and I can. And then suddenly you start saving the planet again. And then you're like, oh, this is too hard. <laughs> I'm going to watch a movie. <laughs> and it just keeps going on and on. Um, yeah, yeah, just like listening to what um what Paul was saying earlier about um the research. It was like hearing someone talk about, you know, your your um astrology sign and being like, oh, okay, that ticks. Um just about, you know, this this whole pressure from I remember at one point, I, I guess around this this time last year, it just felt like, okay, if I don't do more today. Um, every single day is, is a countdown towards, I think I had in mind exactly 2050, the world's going to blow up and I've got this, this much, these many years to, you know, do something about it and every day counts. And so going to sleep every night and, um, 
waking up each morning was just very stressful because you just feel like there's no way you can't do enough um, and you can't sleep well. You wake up and you're just anxious um, and it's it's not good. <laughs> yeah, I think all of us here and I imagine a lot of people watching and a lot of other activists can completely identify with what you've just said about that cycle of don't want to work too hard, but I also feel like I need to do something about what's going on. Um, Paul, I'm interested um, to know if you've got any advice for activists who are feeling overwhelmed or frustrated in terms of, you know, how they can deal with the, the kind of problems of eco-anxiety and everything else going on before burnout happens to kind of avoid that crash? Uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, well, I think the most important thing is just having open conversations about it and, uh, and uh, I think in a lot of movements, I think also moving from a focus on self-care to a focus on community care. So I'm not just thinking about how do I take care of myself as an activist, but I also reflect on how do my beliefs and actions affect the other activists around me and maybe contribute to their burnout. Uh, you know, I, I think moving from that purely self-care to a community care model and then just having conversations about it. And I would really encourage also uh, organizational leaders and movement leaders uh, who often seem to be people who can work 80 hours a week uh, and then end up having uh, ridiculous expectations for the people in their organizations. Uh, you know, I mean, I, again, I think we can all do stuff for ourselves and sort of let go of this pressure that we have to do everything. But I also think it's really important to think about what we can do for one another to sustain one another uh, as activists. Yeah, and I feel like what you're saying there about community care really fits in well with what Days was talking about around, you know, regenerative culture and that kind of, you know, looking after each other within, within the movement. So Days, do you have any kind of, quick, you know, words of advice for people that might not be familiar with how how to start building that into their community and their movement? Yeah, so I think the the best bit about regenerative cultures is that it's it's really fitted and suited to your community. So it's something that you guys create together and it's this like collaborative effort. For Extinction Rebellion, we see it as like five different like parts, uh, pillars in a way. So the first one is self-care. It's how you take care of the body, the mind, the soul, but also the really deep self-care of asking yourself what part of you know, society do you play? What is the privilege that you hold? How can you dismantle this? And really kind of purging yourself of the toxic systems and toxic socialization that we've we've become accustomed to and re-socializing yourself to be better. And then next, how you can how you relate with other individuals and something on the lines of what Paul said about how your actions affect others and that really like self-awareness that we we should all be aiming for. Um, and then how we can take our healthy selves and our healthy relationships into our community, how we can start building things together how can we start saying you know who needs that extra hand how can I dismantle my privilege to bring other people up how can I take a step back to bring other people forward um, and then how we can take this into action care like I briefly spoke about whether it's you know the the taking care of someone in an action whether it's a debrief post actions we're talking about how we felt not in like a really like oh was it a good action was it a bad action but was it like what was the feelings it brought up in us how did we connect to this action and then finally we taking that to the earth and saying you know we need to learn better and I think especially I normally use the um, example of colonization because colonization we learn how to abuse people we learn how to use people see them as resources and we've done the same to the earth and once we start correcting this behavior change um that's how we're going to get sustainability and not only sustainability but regeneration in all social parts and this is where the climate almost sits as a, a byproduct of um, society collapsing and social justice issues yeah i'm really i'm really glad you brought that um the idea of colonialism up actually because you know, with with the Black Lives Matter protests earlier in the year, I feel like from from what I've seen anyway, especially on social media, there's been a big, you know, rise in, in the amount of conversations happening around the intersection of racial justice and environmental and climate justice. Um, and while we can't predict what's going to happen with um, COVID and lockdowns and everything, um, I'm keen to hear your guys' thoughts on how that kind of intersectionality of different justice issues, especially regarding climate climate change um, is going to change over the next year or so. Bonnie, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think 
I mean, I think it's changing already. I think just bringing up that topic that that intersects so clearly, I think from my experience here, I mean, I'm based in LA in California and, you know, I mean, the, the amount of drilling and kind of facilities, very polluting facilities that exist in California is like very, very high by comparison to any other state in the US and, you know, how disproportionately, um, people are affected by that because most of these facilities are based around communities of low income and people of color. And it's just from my experience of meeting a lot of those um, communities who have now become activists in this space, it's just clear and on your doorstep how the two issues intersect. And I think it's interesting that slowly, or not interesting, I think it's sad that slowly those realities will come closer and closer to our doorsteps, I think, just how disproportionately affected people will become. I think especially as well how, you know, the idea of climate then creating more refugees within this country, I mean, within this world. And I think just more and more, it will just be on our doorstep. And it won't be these things that I think often I have struggled sometimes when you're communicating a story such as marine and ocean plastics it's very very far away and sometimes you don't have that that person you know or person in your neighborhood that has experienced something directly you kind of find it harder to connect to that issue and I think now more and more we will begin to know people who have been affected by a climate related issue um, which is I think what this year so highlighted for us with COVID is is this interconnectedness of things and I was realizing really not that far away from the issue so I think with this intersection of social environmental justice I think it's just going to become clearer and clearer and I think again with this like lifting the veil constantly that I think this time is about this kind of really the transparency that we're wishing to see behind things I just don't think and I think, you know, obviously cancel culture is the extreme of that, but I think people will just be called out more continually. And I don't think people can hide from the issues as much. So I don't know if that answers the question. But yeah. yeah, does anyone else have any thoughts on kind of that intersection of different issues over the next few years? Yeah, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, um, I actually came to climate um, change through air pollution because it affected me and my community. And I think once we start actually understanding how this relates, like I remember when I lived in Lincolnshire, for six years we experienced flooding every year, but we were just told that was just flooding and it just kind of happens every year. And when I found out, no, this is not just happening, this is climate change and moving to London and having asthma and realizing, oh no, it's not just because London's air is polluted, it's because there's so much traffic, there's motorways in amidst communities, there's incinerators in amidst communities. And that was especially with where I'm originally from in North London, there's a massive incinerator that's almost like a mile, two miles away from a hospital. And they're wondering how it's affecting communities. And is this kind of just, uh, as you said before, just saying like, it's just not good enough. And it's always affecting the people who are the most marginalized in communities. And once we start speaking up and saying, this is unacceptable anymore, and we aren't taking it, I feel like things will change. Yeah, can I just jump in here to just, <laughs> Sure, I thought about that too. I think this is an excellent conversation. I love this. I think this needs to start by dealing with the racism that exists within the climate movement and within environmental movements. And to remember, you know, I don't know the story in, in uh, other parts of the world, but in the US, the environmental justice movement was started by Black uh, families uh, because of the uh, toxic uh, sites that were being cited uh, near their homes, the environmental movement and sustainability and climate movement themselves have been colonized by kind of liberalish white people, uh, many of whom, well, if you bring up race, will just say, well, if we're talking, you know, we're not focusing on the environment if we talk about race and they want to separate uh, the issues. And so, um, and, and, uh, uh, the, the fact that, again, at least in the U.S., the public face of these movements is white, but a majority of the people doing the most important activist work on the ground in communities are, are uh, people of color, people of the global majority. So uh, I, I think this has to start with dealing not just racism, but also dealing with uh, sexism and other forms of oppression that exist within 
environmental uh, movements. And if we refuse to do that, I mean, we're all just hypocrites uh, in the end uh, because all these justice issues are interconnected. Yeah, yeah, so true. And yeah, I'm really, I'm really glad you raised that point, Paul, about where the kind of environmental justice movement started. I think it's so important to acknowledge um, where the movement came from and how it's been built upon, um, and and kind of give you know thanks and gratefulness to the people that started that and have and have we kind of you know built upon that as as um, the years have gone on. It's so important to recognise where that movement began. Um, so we're coming up to kind of towards the end of the panel um, I'm really interested in hearing a few last thoughts from you guys um, a little bit more personal um, kind of specifically around any practices or resources that you have that you find most useful or most comforting or that you would suggest to other people um, in terms of coping and managing your own well-being um, what you do to avoid burnout or what you would you know suggest to a friend or a colleague to avoid burnout um, that you have found particularly useful um, for yourself or your community. Lynn, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, um, I've, I've had a lot of coping mechanisms for just um, climate activism. Um, I think my biggest breakdown was yeah around the same time last year, this, this year. Um, but, you know, it just got to one point where every day I was just sacrificing my own mental well-being with with climate activism and you know i'd wake up at two three in the morning and just just cry it's like i'm gonna die <laughs> um and and just wanting it to stop um and at one point my my friend just asked me like what are you doing this for you know or this does this make you happy and i think that really made me question why i'm doing all of this um and then I just work through it, and and what I've come up with this this mental mindset model that has really worked well for me is um just kind of <laughs> in a way giving up all hope and uh, <laughs> accepting that okay you know we're 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 kind of doomed, but then at the same time be because I guess accepting that okay we're all gonna die um. And that brings me such relief because I'm like, okay, well, um, I'm not pressured to succeed in, you know, saving the planet and, and living eternally. <laughs> um, and I'm just going to do my best regardless of whether, you know, polluting corporates or governments um, listen to our demands, regardless of whether this whole activism works at all. I'm just going to do my best and and have this wonderful vision of the world and just move forward to there. Um, and yeah, I think that 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 sort of you know um, acceptance of of not um, ever succeeding <laughs> gives me some kind of relief because I'm I'm just not pressured every day that like this is virtually impossible that we're going to reverse climate change. And so I've just got that 1%, you know, to, to strive for. And it's, it's so difficult. So, so instead I'm just saying, well, you know, it's not going to work, but you know, what's, what's, um, there's nothing to lose to try. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I feel like I know what you mean. You kind of under, under promise and under, under expect. In a way. <laughs> Um, so that any kind of success feels like a huge win. <laughs> um, Days, how about you? Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I've had moments, especially over the last like couple of weeks, I was doing some research for this thing I'm doing. And I saw a photo of the home that I lived in Lincolnshire being flooded and flooding to the point of it actually being above, uh, much higher than me, um, which, which really saddened me. I did have a moment of like that deep sorrow of, of grieving and understanding that you know predictions are showing that in 2030 large parts of Lincolnshire will cease to exist anymore and this will cause you know like people having to leave their homes and leaving what they love and you know it, it, it is really sad but then I have this there's this phrase that um one of my like uh, elders in activism taught me and it's the idea of love and rage and how every single day 
there is at least something that makes us smile or giggle and laugh. And the fact that the world is so shit now, especially after COVID, and we can still find such joy and love within our communities, within our families, within ourselves. Um, that That is what we're aiming for. And imagine right now seeing it survival and then the next step is flourishing. And that's what we're aiming for with our activism. We're aiming to flourish. We're aiming to live lives that mean and feel true to us. And then that rage is the space of having space to grieve the loss that you're feeling and like holding yourself in that and asking people to hold you within that as well and finding a community which can hold you within the grief that you're feeling and using that rage and the anger and as um, Lynn had mentioned before that youthful passion to really fight for what you believe in and I think just having that you know whenever I sign off emails I always go love and rage because I want everyone to remember the beauty of life and the fire that burns inside you to create social change yeah that's a really lovely answer actually and I guess remembering those kind of moments of of happiness also reminds you of why you're doing what you're doing to kind of save that joy and that that happiness yeah Yeah. even um I got a poster in rebellion that said um this is the only way you can dance yourself out of extinction (laughs) and that's like one of my favorite phrases now so I always tell everyone I'm like the protest you're dancing yourself out of extinction (laughs) (laughs) love that my next mantra going forward (laughs) uh Bonnie any last thoughts on this uh yeah I think I think you know activism and all of these spaces are very kind of I mean, maybe not so much this year as we're not so much on the streets or doing public events, but it can be quite a sort of, you know, it's quite an outward sort of way to relate and connect with people and the issue. And I personally, I'm quite an introverted person. So find sometimes those spaces and constantly putting out there can be quite overwhelming. So I find when I do get to that kind of overwhelming burnout of being around a a big issue or a lot of people, I find it's just these small kind of practices within the kind of four walls of my home that's to somewhat an environment I can kind of contain that helped me to sort of reconnect with change and my cause and effect on things I mean just like as an example um like my compost bin is like a very direct connection I have with change with sort of creating a, a complete closed loop cycle of my waste and seeing how I can re generate something into new energy and I'd like to think of that kind of idea of of waste even if it's like a wasted emotion or something that can become energy again once it's like given that chance to regenerate so it's really quiet practices like that I personally find as a really helpful way to kind of feel that I do have some control and I can see some tangible impact because uh yeah often things on the computer or online can be just very conceptual So I find things like that can help me to reconnect and feel a bit more empowered uh, in the situation. Yeah, I think as 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 activists, we often most of our focus is on that kind of system change lens and, you know, holding big corporations and governments to account. But sometimes it does feel quite satisfying knowing that you've done something yourself positive that day, like composting or saying no to a, you know, disposable coffee cup. Um, Tiny, tiny little things, but sometimes they make you feel a bit Oh, I actually had a positive thing today that happened. Um, and Paul, we've already kind of heard your um, advice on on what you would give to other people to avoid burnout. But I'm I'm really keen to hear what you do on a kind of more personal level yourself. Um, as a someone who's been an activist most of my life, virtually all my close friends are activists, and uh, and so I find that I spend basically all the time I'm spending with people, uh, spending with other activists. And uh, I had to, and, and there are these really beautiful, loving people in the activist community. There are also some very toxic people uh, in activist community. So one thing that I started doing was just thinking about who I'm spending time with outside of, uh, outside of my activism and also, uh, and sort of my closest circle of friends, we kind of do these exercises about how long can we, like if we're hanging out some afternoon, how long can we hang out without talking about our activism? Can we just talk about gardening? Can we talk about, uh, you know, just something, you know, just give our bodies and brains a, a, a break from that, knowing that we're actually strengthening our activism just by 
connecting with each other and and growing our love and respect for one another. So I think, you know, thinking about how I spend my time outside of my activism and with whom I spend it uh, and trying to spend it with uh, not people who are who are like mindlessly positive, but just not people who are mindlessly negative and toxic. Yeah, that, that wraps really nicely kind of back into what Dave was saying about about finding that joy and 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 noticing and recognizing the nice, happy, joyful things that are happening around us. Um, thank you all so, so much for those answers and for your participation in the panel. Um, it's been super interesting for me. So no doubt it's been super interesting for everyone that has um, been watching and listening as well. Um, I hope those of you who are watching and listening have found it useful and have you know, got some advice about how to deal with burnout or that you can pass on to your communities. Um, and thank you very much.